Hello, I'm Sam Granger, Geo Environmental Consultant, formerly with Socotech, but now with Arcadis. Before I start, I'd like to thank the conference chairs for this excellent session and for SBE for allowing this conference to proceed during COVID-19. I'll be presenting, are there potentially significant long-term health consequences of exposure to fine airborne particulate matter, PM10, to personnel on the United Kingdom's offshore drilling rigs? Many of us are aware of the increased public consciousness of air pollution in the UK. Before COVID-19, approximately 40,000 people died in the UK every year due to poor quality air. These deaths were usually due to secondary medical conditions involving respiratory, vascular or neurological complications. One of the main forms of air pollution, dust, is typically assessed by measuring PM10, i.e. that's dust with an aerodynamic diameter of about 10 microns, which is say a sixth of the width of the human hair. Long-term exposure to PM10 can overwhelm the lung's ability to dislodge these particles, reducing the lung's capacity and causing scarring to the lung tissue. This is the disease known as pneumoconiosis, which is a family of disorders, including silicosis, coal miner's lung and asbestosis. The regulation of air quality in the workplace has evolved over time, with current regulations requiring air quality to be at least as good as the air outside the building. In the context of specific dusts and gases, such as fine silica, dust and helium, there are maximum exposure limits under the COSH umbrella, including regulations such as the EH40 limits. Perhaps one of the best ways to think about exposure to environmental contaminants is to use the source pathway receptor model, predominantly introduced in the Environmental Protection Act of 1990. The source pathway receptor model seeks to identify a potential source of air pollution, how that source might travel through the air, and the receptor is the person who inhales it. Using the source pathway receptor model, I've considered whether there are any aerosol generating activities taking place on an offshore oil and gas rig. So with that in mind, I've compiled a list of key potential areas around the rig, which might generate dust. Assume that this fine dust would be transmitted relatively easily, and lastly that there are employees there who might be inhaling these dusts. Exposure concentrations and duration aren't something which is directly considered by the model, but I have taken these into account. With that in mind, the predominant risk to employees' long-term health is likely to be from near-source emissions. The drilling rig's well circulation system is the focus of my research as the main source of airborne particulate on the drilling rig. In simple terms, the process starts in the chemical mixing area where chemicals and powders such as bentonite are added to the mud to create a bespoke drilling mud capable of penetrating through the complex location geology. The chemicals are mixed in a series of tanks known as the mud tanks before they are pumped at high pressure through piping i.e. the rotary hose and down through the casing to the bottom of the hole. Here, high pressure mud powers the drill bit, crushing and progressing the hole. The mud and crushed rock fragments are returned to the surface via the annular space to the shale shaker, which removes rock cuttings via a vibrating metal plate, and then on to a series of centrifuges, which remove silt and gases before the mud is returned to the mud tanks, ready to restart the cycle. This model only focuses on airborne exposure to the human respiratory system. Airborne particulate can travel long distances as a single speck of dust might travel for hundreds of miles in wind currents. So an airborne pathway close to the mud circulation system is likely to exist wherever there are significant sources. Humans inhale PM10 by the nose and mouth. When these particles are inhaled, they progress down the throat, where they sometimes become stuck on tiny hairs called cilia and are swept up by the beating of these hairs, known as the mucociliary elevator, to the epiglottis, where they can become coughed up or swallowed. Particles half this size can travel down into the bronchi, that's particles PM5 range. Uh, they get down into the branch of the lungs, and particles half the size of this again, PM2.5, can go down into even more sensitive areas of the lungs, uh, such as the alveolar space. The very finest particles, i.e. nanoparticles, can penetrate through the lungs and enter into the bloodstream directly.
I always think it's important to show examples, so here's an example of the source pathway receptor model around the waste processing areas. Processed dried arisings drop from the shale shaker into a waste tank below. As the material falls and splashes, there's some limited aerosol generation. Additionally, the material tends to be warm due to geothermal heat. When the warm material encounters cold outdoor temperatures, it can generate steam, which may also carry pollutants. In this example, both employees might be exposed to PM10, as there is a source, a pathway and a receptor. In this example, neither employee is wearing respiratory PPE, which could have offered some further protection. In this example, three workers called roughnecks are on the rig drill floor. Whilst this example is taken from land drilling in Ohio, similar scenes are common on offshore oil and gas rigs in and around Europe. The workers are adding casing. To do this, they disconnect the rotary hose. When the hose is disconnected, it can pour unused drilling mud onto the floor, which might generate a small amount of aerosol. The drilling mud slurry might also flow and then dry across the rig, sometimes being transported away from the rig floor to other areas on the bottom of shoes, etc. When this material dries, it can later become resuspended, either underfoot again, or by the wind. Where this happens, not only do you have exposure to three roughnecks, but potentially to personnel anywhere on the rig. So getting into the nitty gritty of this model, most of the oil and gas industry focus efforts on a more hazardous subtype of PM10 called oil mist. Oil mist is defined as an aerosolized oil and dissolved chemical droplets a quarter of the size of PM10, i.e. PM2.5, which can cause even more severe effects on human health. A single pollutant approach when assessing PM10 exposure, however, should not be used, as the interaction between chemical and physical dust hazards is an important aspect of respiratory health decline. This paper, therefore, uses a simple conversion based on 14 data points from co-monitored solid particulate and oil mist readings from the research of Hansen 1991 and Steinsvarg in 2006. These are then plotted on a scatter graph and a line of best fit drawn to determine the trend of the formula. The formula is then used to convert around 40 readings taken from 11 papers focusing on oil rigs predominantly in the North Sea. Using the formula on the previous page and the estimates of area and personal air pollution from the literature review, it is possible to estimate the hypothesized area and personal concentration for seven areas of the drill rig. The hypothesized water-based mud column applies as it assumes that all liquid is fresh water and the contamination is entrained as solid particles. Alternatively, the oil-based totals are based on the liquid comprising low toxicity oil. In this model, the PM10 estimates of solid particulate are well under the governmental guidelines of 10 milligrams when assessing mixed low toxicity particulate. Oil-based mud, however, is shown to exceed these levels by a factor of three on the drill floor. It is important to note that oil mist is four times smaller than PM10 and a guideline value of four milligrams should be used. Not only this, but oil mist is a regulated chemical by the HSC of one milligram. In this model then, the actual concentrations might be 28 times the guideline on the rig floor. Following these trigger guidelines, the sack room, mud tanks, hydraulic pumps, waste areas and shale shakers would all be above the governmental guideline of one milligram for oil, ba uh, for oil based particulate. We can evaluate the solid fraction PM10 further by assessing the chemistry of the mud. One of the most well known inorganic compounds causing pneumoconiosis is silica. Fortunately, in 1991, Hansen undertook elemental analysis on airborne particulate from a shale shaker. The study found that clean water-based drilling mud contains 13.2% silica, whilst dirty 
mud contains 15.7% silica. Multiplying the elemental concentrations in Hansen and multiplying these by the likely drilling mud concentration and type of various parts of the rig, it is possible to determine the silica area concentration. However, we can go further than this still. In 2002, the HSE undertook a groundbreaking study on Scottish coal miners. The HSC undertook air pollution monitoring underground at various scenes within a mine and x-rayed the workers who had been in continuous employment for 15 years. From this data, the HSC were able to evaluate the cumulative exposure to workers from their working environment and the risk of them developing silica nodules in their lungs. Factoring in this information into our model, we can work out the risk of silicosis development at various parts of the rig. Here we have the outputs of the model, with the estimated solid concentration on the left, the estimated concentration for Hansen in the middle, and the area concentration multiplied by the area concentration in the last, but one column, followed by the risk of developing silicosa nodules in the last column. It's important to note as a threshold, the HSE allows 0.1 milligrams per cubic meter in workplace air, which would lead to a pneumoconiosis risk of around 2.5%. The areas which present a more significant risk are mud tanks, rig floor and waste areas. The mud tanks, despite only indicating a risk of around 3%, are important as they can be found under footways, which might lead to exposure in otherwise much lower risk personnel, or could lead to ongoing exposure even when workers are away from high risk areas. As per our example, the waste areas are shown to be consistently high risk, or silicosis exposure, especially in light of the material comprising rock fragments, especially in silicate rich geology. Where employees are involved in such tasks consistently, there might be a 1 in 10 risk of them developing silicosis, according to the model. However, the highest risk area is the rig floor, where there is an almost 80% risk of developing silicosis, which is over 30 times the apparent HSE threshold risk. It is important to note that this is only a scoping model, however, with a limited amount of data points, but I hope this is quite thought-provoking and offers further research opportunity. The weaknesses of the model are that currently there's a limited amount of data points in the public domain and many of these quite hold. HSE practices are therefore likely to have improved greatly from the 1990s where some of these values are taken from. Furthermore, due to the shift pattern work of offshore workers, 15 years of daily exposure is unlikely to take place as workers enjoy long periods of rest between deployments, reducing their overall risk. Even where these risks are corroborated with a robust data set, it's impossible to fully evaluate the role of mixed particulate in this way without having complex epidemiological research. Nevertheless, the values are quite thought-provoking. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please do pop them over on the session chairs for the discussion in the Q&A. However, if you'd rather email me, my contact details are on the screen. Thank you so much for your time.